Okay, here we are with the shoulder joint slides, and this comes from the Manual of Structural Kinesiology by R.T. Floyd. It's been modified by myself. All right, so some background and then bony landmarks of the shoulder joint. We need to remember, if you watched the previous videos on the shoulder girdle, that the shoulder joint is attached to the skeleton, to the axioskeleton, only through the clavicle at the SC joint. So just one very small, somewhat weak joint attaching the upper extremity to the rest of the axial skeleton. And then we have a lot of supporting musculature that helps to um, stabilize as well as move the shoulder girdle in order for your upper extremity to articulate. And as the humerus moves, scapula movement usually also occurs. So we have that synergistic effect between the shoulder joint movement and the scapular movement. The shoulder joint is capable of a wide range of motion in many different planes, but this requires a significant amount of laxity, which this laxity in turn leads to some common instability problems, rotator cuff impingement, subluxations, dislocations. The price of mobility at any joint is reduced stability. So we have this spectrum, so to speak, of mobility and stability. If mobility is on this end and stability is on this end, you can't really have um, the most of both of those. You can't be as mobile as possible and as stable as possible. You know, you think of a, a very stable joint, like let's say your, I don't know, your hip joint is much more stable than your shoulder joint. It, they're both ball and socket joints, so we can kind of compare them. Well, the hip joint is highly stable in that it has a deep acetabulum. It has very big, large um, uh, muscles with a lot of tension on them to hold the femur into place whereas the shoulder is a, more of a highly mobile joint, uh, but it lacks a lot of the same stability features as the hip. So it's more mobile at the sacrifice of that stability, which is one reason why we have that shoulder girdle musculature helping to stabilize the region and to reorient the glenoid fossa to improve that mobility as well. Now, as far as the bones, we're going to be focusing on the scapula again, but also on the humerus. Um, so we need to introduce some of the humeral uh, landmarks. So we have the head of the humerus. That's just going to be you know, this part right here, the humeral head, the part that articulates with the glenoid fossa. The greater tubercle is here at the top. The lesser tubercle is here. And then you have this groove that goes between these two tubercles, the intertubicular groove. And then the deltoid tuberosity down here where your deltoid inserts. And then here we can see the glenohumeral joint. So here's that shallow glenoid fossa. And that's really, that's all of the articulation between the scapula and the humerus. So not very much at all, not very much surface area contact. Here's the, just to review, here's a coracoid process, a chromium process, AC joint right here in between those two. At this sternal end of the clavicle, we have the SC joint as well. Now, when we look at this glenoid fossa um, from straight on, from this view, we can see inside of it, we have this uh, glenoid labrum that sort of wraps around the fossa and enhances stability slightly. So here's this glenoid labrum going around the fossa. And then you can see all of the tendons that cross this area and ligaments, as well as the rotator cuff muscles. So here's the supraspinatus tendon, here's infraspinatus tendon, teres minor, and subscapularis, the rotator cuff muscles. Um, on the glenohumeral joint, the ligaments provide a lot of the stability especially anteriorly and inferiorly. Now in this class, we're focusing more on the musculature than on these ligaments, but if you've ever met somebody who has uh, dislocated their shoulder before and has since done it frequently, it's because these ligaments can tend to become very lax when you, uh, if you dislocate your shoulder one time, it's more likely to happen again. I actually have a buddy in Tennessee who is a fisherman, very avid fisherman from a kayak. He goes out into the woods and, and will fish late at night with his kayak. and so. The, the unfortunate thing about my buddy Mike is that he tends to dislocate his shoulder. And this has actually happened to him before when he's trekked into the woods, 
for several miles, kayaked upstream to some super secret fishing location. And then as he's hauling in a fish or, or carrying his kayak or something like that, he dislocates his shoulder. And it's because he has done that in the past and these uh, ligaments tend to be very, uh, they're just very lax on him. And so it's easier for him to do it again if he's reaching up for something or exerting force in a certain way and that humeral head just pops right out of the socket. And it's really painful to get it back in. And, and I'm, I, he actually hasn't been able to successfully put his shoulder back into the socket on his own. So I, you can imagine the type of trek back to the car that that was for poor Mike <laughs> as he threw his shoulder out in the woods in the middle of nowhere carrying a kayak. Now, one reason that these ligaments are lax is because of the extreme ranges of motion that your shoulder joint is required to go through. So they're lax though until your shoulder reaches more extreme ranges of motion. And at those extreme ranges, um, the ligaments, all the slack is taken out of them and tension is developed. But when they're not at those extreme ranges, we have stability being sacrificed to gain mobility. So because of this anatomical design that favors mobility and sacrifices stability, we tend to get a lot of injuries of the shoulder. So recall that it's because of the shallowness of the glenoid fossa, laxity in the ligaments, and a lack of strength and endurance that we often see in individuals, especially those upper back musculature, the posterior deltoid, rotator cuff muscles, those can become, un, uh, they can fall into disuse without proper uh, training or even, uh, you know, normal rigorous activities. If you're not, if you're not out hiking and, and climbing and uh, throwing a ball back and forth and weight training and running and, you know, just being generally active, the, that musculature will become weak and disused and you can fall into any of these problems subluxations or dislocations, um, posterior instability. Uh, we also, not listed here, but there's also shoulder impingement. There's uh, upper cross syndrome, a lot of things that can happen at the shoulder joint. So the big takeaways from this video are that by sacrificing some stability, the shoulder joint can increase its mobility, uh, but it does so at the, at the greater risk of injury. So the shoulder joint is an often injured structure. Um, however, by strengthening the musculature, so rotator cuff muscles especially, by taking care of the ligaments, so um, you know, not, uh, not relying on those ligaments to keep the humeral head in the glenoid fossa, but rather relying more on the musculature to do so by strengthening it, and by making sure that you have good technique on movements that you're doing with your shoulder, whether that's throwing, whether that's weight training, or any other athletic movement, by doing those things, we can reduce injury at the shoulder joint. In the next video, we'll be talking about movements of the shoulder joint, especially in conjunction with movements of the shoulder girdle. Okay, guys and gals, that wraps up that video about the background and bony landmarks of the shoulder joint. It works in conjunction with the shoulder girdle. They're synergistic together. Now, to continue learning about it, head over to this link right here about the joint movements at the shoulder don't forget, if you have any questions, leave them down below in the comments and I'd love to answer them for you if I can. Thanks a lot. See you guys on the next video.